Welcome everyone to the Home Service Summit webinar series. Um, very excited to have Jim on from Princeton Equity Group. And, and very shortly, we're going to get into uh, his story and what he's, how involved he's been in franchising. Uh, and in part of full disclosure, if, if all you don't know, uh, Pfizer Franchising partnered with Princeton Equity Group um, a few years ago. And, and, I'll, and I'll just in terms of kicking this off, I'll say that one of the big reasons that, that for me, I, I chose to partner with Princeton Equity Group was um, I sensed a much more entrepreneurial venture vibe than um, than I experienced in private equity. And, I, and I've invested in a number of private equity funds. I've, I've sit on a number of boards that are private equity owned. And so I've got a lot of experience in, in, that, in that category. And as I, as I explored partnering with a company, I found that Jim and his team and Doug, uh, the two co-founders, they, you know, they know founders, they know franchising. And so it seemed like a natural fit. So take that with a grain of salt as we talk about today. You know, I, 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 am, uh, I, I am kind of, you know, a flattering Jim for good reason. Uh, he is on my board at Pfizer <laughs> Franchising. But uh, we're going to make sure that we get as much value from this conversation as possible so that you as founders, as you're, as you're listening in, can learn from what's happening in franchising and what's happening in private equity. So a uh, quick uh, disclaimer, the Home Services Summit webinar series is all about bringing you guys content specific to home services and franchising. And every month we do that around the first or second week of the th on Thursday. This, uh, this session will go for about an hour. We'll take about 45 minutes where Jim and I will have our conversation and we'll get into to all kinds of good questions. And then feel free at any point in time, you'll notice there's a chat on the bottom right of this uh, interface. Hit that chat. Make sure you load in any questions you may have for Jim or I, and I'll make sure we get to those uh, during the interview. So uh, let me go ahead and give you some background on Jim. It's super interesting. Uh, Jim co-founded Princeton Equity Group and co-leads its investment activities and sits on the firm's investment committee. So if they're going to make an investment, it has to go by him. Prior to co-founding Princeton, Jim spent nearly 20 years as a private equity investor at Summit Partners, ABS Capital, and the predecessor firm, Princeton Ventures, which he founded in 2006. So that probably is why there's a, that venture vibe. He's kind of been there, been part of a venture fund. And, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit later about what the difference is between, you know, search funds, independent sponsors, private equity versus venture capital. We'll kind of talk about that as well. Jim is also the founder and chairman of Princeton Med Spa Partners, a leading consolidator and franchisor in the non-invasive medical aesthetics industry. And if I'm not mistaken, Jim, you guys own a number of franchises as part of this group that are part of, uh, that, that are franchisees, if you will. And so uh, the current investments that Princeton has, I was actually just at their new office in Dallas at a board meeting a few weeks ago, and there was the Wall of Fame where it had every single logo that Princeton Equity Group had been part of. And so I'll just kind of give you guys a background on what those are so you get a sense of uh, which port codes exist and uh, what categories they're in. So Accelerated Brands is a parent company to Strickland Brothers and Trademark Car Wash. Uh, Pertech, which is a deal they just announced, part of Fund 2, which we'll get into here shortly was just, I think, a few weeks ago closed. Uh, Card My Yard, D1 Training, Ellie Mental Health, Stretch Zone, Pfizer Franchising My Business, which owns Packouts, Textiles, Bass Solutions, Bio One, and Gotcha Covered, Mosquito Shield, and Pronexus. Uh, Princeton Equity Group also made an investment in IFPG, which is um, a very strategic partnership and one that I'm proud to be on the board of, and I get to participate with Jim in terms of helping Don and his team in executing um, uh, a lot of great things in the industry. And then uh, last but not least, Stellar Brands, the parent company to Blue Frog Plumbing, Drain, Restoration One, Soft Rock, and the Driveway Company. Uh, previous investment experience includes European Wax Center, acquired by General Atlantic, HOPC, acquired by Odex and Linden, Massage Envy, acquired by Rourke, and Radiance Holdings. And I mean, the list goes on, right? And, and uh, you were a George Washington scholar. I don't, what does that mean, Jim? What does it mean to be a George Washington scholar? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, one of the very uh, cool things about Washington and Lee is that uh, actually a large number, uh, today it might be 20%, 15 or 20% of undergrads get to go to Washington and Lee on an academic scholarship. So I was lucky enough to be one of those folks that uh, had a full tuition scholarship and they're called George, Wa they were called George Washington Scholars. Um, I don't know if I lived up to the title. Uh, <laughs> I think... Uh, I think a lot of those folks were, were pretty smart, but uh, oh, I uh, think you might be one thing to leave school without debt. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I bet. 
Well, that's great. Hey, Jim, thanks for joining us on, on this uh, on this webinar. Let's um, dive right into it. What? How'd you get into franchising? Tell us your origin story. Every super, ser- superhero has one. I'm sure you yeah. do as well. And, uh, and then we can get into some questions we've got for you. Yeah, Scott. Uh, and, and thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so um, I was very fortunate to discover franchising. Uh, my history is I started as a software investor. And indeed, as you mentioned, um, in the setup, my my predecessor firm was called Princeton Ventures. Um, so I started at Summit Partners, which is a very well-known, very large um, software investor. I went to another firm called ABS Capital and then thought I was going to start doing software investments at, at my own firm. Um, when I first saw um, Massage Envy, um, to me, uh, it looked like a software business, right? A, a franchisor licenses um a brand a playbook often a protected territory to a franchisee in exchange for a license fee and there's an ongoing royalty just like a software company um licenses code to someone in exchange for a license fee or yeah. maybe a subscription um so i instantly kind of got a lot of the the great things about the franchise or business model because it again looked like something that i knew from software investing um was lucky enough to be able to um, acquire the franchisor, Massage Envy, kind of put that deal together. And we were able to dramatically grow that business, uh, ultimately getting it to 800 locations, well over a billion of system revenue. Um, and we were able to sell that to Rourke. Um, and that was a very, very successful investment. Um, we, we, we created a lot of equity value in a short period of time. And when that's kind of your formula, your, your first experience, your formative experience in an industry, you really take note. And yeah. by the way, it kind of made me feel like franchising was uh, maybe easier than it turned out to be. Uh, <laughs> and that was your first one. Um, oh, boy. Now we all we, can live to that. That's great. <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> but we were uh, then lucky enough to then get to European Wax Center and Solo Salon Studios, and then the, the list continues. So. It's been a wonderful industry to be a part of, uh, an absolute privilege. And I just, I just love what we do. We, we help people get into business for themselves and ultimately uh, probably create more equity value for themselves and their families than they could probably do on their own, certainly with a lot less risk. So uh, we, we love that. Uh, for us, it's, it's a mission that we're on and uh, it's just been a wonderful industry. Well, uh, you mentioned that um, that your investment with uh, Massage Envy was one of your very first deals you made, right? And uh, and I couldn't agree more. As I, you know, people ask me what got you into franchising and why do you franchise a painting company? And I and I kept saying, look, royalties are really high margins, just like software fees, and it's recurring revenue and it's diversified, and you don't ha- you don't have the same concentration risk you'd have in most businesses. Yeah. And so there's all these like wonderful things. I think anyone who's on this call recognizes about franchising. And so I, it, it makes a lot of sense why you'd be attracted to it. But you um, you mentioned earlier, and we talked about that there is a kind of an independent sponsor search fund type of view of, of capital. I wouldn't mind just doing a crash course for those who are listening because they hear different words. You know, what, if you don't mind, maybe just explain to us what's d- different between a search fund or an independent sponsor or a, a venture capital fund versus a private equity fund. like. If you were to yeah. look at those, how are they different from each other? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I've done a little bit of all of that over the years. Uh, so I started out at um, uh, private equity and venture capital firms. Uh, then I started my own uh, independent sponsor, or sometimes they're called fundless sponsors or search firms. And then today we, we've we raised over a billion dollars of institutional capital that, uh, that we use to invest in our um, franchise and multi-unit businesses. So what, what does sort of all of that mean? Um, so in some respects, it's a strategy, right? So if people are saying venture or private equity or a hedge fund or, right, they're, they're really talking a little bit more about a strategy. Uh, venture capital, usually you're investing in early stage businesses. They may not even have revenue, um, or if they have revenue, they, they probably don't have EBITDA or profit. Um, Private equity tends to be a strategy um, that 
that people talk about when they're talking about later stage investing, um, investing in businesses that have uh, real profitability. Um, and the way a venture firm might invest in a business, a lot of those proceeds are probably going on a balance sheet to fuel growth. The way a private equity firm invests, they may be buying the entire business from the founder or maybe some other owner. Maybe it's a 50 year old business and the founder is long gone. And they might be doing something called a leverage buyout where they're mm -hmm. actually using debt and equity to buy typically control of a business. Um, at Princeton Equity Group, we're a little bit of a hybrid. Um, really not venture. Uh, we, although tend to be a control investor, we're generally backing the original founder and that founder continues to own uh, a lot of the business going forward. And they ultimately partner with us because they have that growth mindset that venture businesses tend to have. And so we tend to be much more growth oriented. We really want to build big companies here of extraordinary value. Um, so that takes a different mindset than your typical, say, LBO investor. So we're kind of in the middle of, of those two strategies. And then when you think about, well, what does an independent, what does it mean to be an independent sponsor or what does it mean to have a fund? Well, that's more about how you, how you actually operate your business as an investor. And one model is you find the deal, then you find the capital uh, mm -hmm. to go with the deal. That's kind of the independent sponsor model. What we do is we go get the capital first and we arrange that capital in a committed fund. Uh, for example, our latest fund's a, a $575 million fund. Uh, investors commit that capital to us and then we invest it in uh, uh, individual investments. Uh, so we get the capital first and then the investment second. So I think it's one of those things entrepreneurs really need to be aware of. Um, there are folks out there that seem like they have capital, but they really may not have capital. And what you really want from a partner, uh, if you decide to have one uh, in your business, is you want to know up front how they're actually going to get the money <laughs> to, that they either have or say, they're, they're, say that they have uh, to, to, to invest in your, in your business as a founder. Yeah, so maybe said otherwise, an independent sponsor is basically just trying to put you under contract, so then go sell the contract to a bunch of investors and in some cases, and you, and you did this on your own with Massage Envy, I believe, right? It was an, uh, as an independent sponsor. So in some, in some cases, you may already have those relationships ready to go, but they're just not committed. So now you have to kind of circle the wagons and find out who's going to put in how much. And, and in all these cases, there's always, I believe, except for maybe in venture, I don't know, you can comment on this, but there's always some form of debt that's brought in to the deal process. If you don't mind, Jim, maybe just... For those that have never had done a deal, maybe explain why does private equity like bringing in debt? You know, what's the rationale, the finance rationale to bring in debt on these transactions? Yes. So, uh, so we've done it both ways. Uh, we can invest in an equity only structure or where it's appropriate, uh, we could do equity and then we'll go get debt from a lender. And we arrange the, all of that. Uh, sure, yeah. So, so why use debt? Um, it's very much like buying a house. Why would you get a mortgage on your home purchase or a real estate purchase? Uh, and it's really twofold. One, it allows you to potentially buy a larger house uh, than you could afford with just the equity. Um, and then secondarily, um, it allows you to create a, a larger return on that equity investment. So our cost of capital as equity investors it would be much higher than the cost of capital of third party debt. And if I can use debt plus equity, I can average down uh, mm -hmm. a, a lower weighted average cost of capital, which as a founder, um, if you have a lower weighted average cost of capital for your business, it means people will pay more for that company. Your business can be more valuable, um, yeah, yeah. which is why founders generally like to use some debt as well as equity. It allows the the equity investor to pay more for that equity that they're they're contributing. The whack, the weighted average cost of capital. I think it's, it's yeah. important to note for listeners as well, because I think, um, and we'll probably talk about this later, maybe we can talk about it right now, you know, some of the trends that are happening in general 
around companies and valuations of companies. And, you know, you've been at this for a while. You mentioned 2006. So it's been, it's been a, a minute. And, um, and I'm sure for those of you who, who have been around this industry, multiples have changed over the, over the last while. Historically speaking, the cost of capital is at an all-time low. And whenever you have the average cost of capital being lower, ultimately the multiples that could be derived from the value of business go up, right? And in, in fact, you even may see um, the stock market went up today and yesterday, right? Well, the feds came out and said they're dropping interest rates next year, maybe three or four times. And what does the market do? Right away, all equities start going up because ultimately every asset is simply the, the, the current value of all future cash flows. And the way that those cash flows are valued is discounting with an a discount rate, which is always tied to the Fed rates. And so if you're always, if you're wondering, well, why are, why does this happen? Well, if the Feds increase rates, equity values go down. If the Feds lower rates, equity values go up. It's, it, it's an inverse relationship that's always present. So maybe if you don't mind, Jim, just speak a little bit to us about what's happened over the last 17 years in private equity, what you've seen has changed. Yeah. Is debt a larger part of the conversation now than it was before? Uh, maybe just kind of speak to that. Yeah. So look, um, over the last 20, 25 years almost, um, uh, there are a few really key trends. One, um, there is just so much more capital available today than there was 25 years ago, uh, both debt and equity capital. So if you just think about how many, how many people, how many private equity firms were investing in franchising uh, 25 years ago, be a very short list. Uh, I mean, 25 years ago, I'm not even sure Rourke was in business. Back then. Right. So uh, look at today and um, the number of firms that have a very high interest in franchising uh, has grown dramatically. So there's just a lot more capital available for that founder thinking about, hey, how do I grow my business? Or is now the time to take some chips off the table? Um, that's the good news. Um, the bad news is, there are now so many folks out there that can write a check. How many of them have actually, actually know something about your business or your industry as a founder? Um, so it actually, in some respects, it's good and bad, right? It's, it's good there's more people knocking on all of our company's doors. Um, the bad thing is you, it's harder and harder to know, is this a good partner or a bad partner? Yeah. Um, look, valuations have certainly increased in franchising since I've started investing. Um, and that's, um, I think, because people have a greater appreciation for how wonderful these business models can be. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take a little bit of credit for it. Uh, we, we, we've had some great successes over the years and have shown people how well they can do in this, in this industry. Uh, it does look easy, I think, maybe on the outside. On the inside, a lot of work and a lot of effort goes into building franchisors and making them scalable and as successful as you know, a lot of our brands have been. But um, those are kind of some of the big trends. And um, at the end of the day, I think these trends are actually really good for our industry. Yeah, there's a competition is always a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think to your point, Jim, and I, and I, I know from my experience in home services in particular, you know, neighborly made it look easy right? I mean, they've had an incredible run. They've built an incredible business. They've got incredible people working the organization and, uh, and it's attracted capital. And, and so uh, I, I can speak from experience here that, you know, doing it myself, here I am building my own platform and, and uh, you know, it, it isn't easy. It, it's a lot of work and having a partner that has done it before uh, is, is extremely valuable. So I, I can completely I relate to that. If you don't mind, Jim, maybe let's talk about, you know, you just fund one uh, was raised a number of years ago. You put the capital to work. You made some acquisitions. We talked about some of those brands earlier. And, you know, fund two was just announced as being closed. You made your first investment out of fund two with Pertech. Maybe just talk to us about like, how, how, just kind of pretend we don't know anything about private equity. Right. What does fund one mean? What does fund two mean? Why is one fund bigger than the other? What do you, is this mean there's going to be a fund 10 at some point at Princess Equity Group? What, how long do these things roll for? Like, yeah. give us a, kind of a background on that, if you don't mind. Yeah, so the structure that has prevailed uh, in our industry um, has really been around for a very long time, this fund structure. Um, 
where um, you put a pool of capital together. Um, it's a partnership. Uh, that partnership has a GP, uh, which is the manager. So that would be me and Doug and our team here. Uh, and then it has limited partners. Um, so if, if you've ever heard somebody refer to an investor as an LP, uh, that's short for limited partner. And these limited partners, for example, in our fund are very large university endowments, insurance companies. Uh, I think if you add up all of the assets that all of our uh, investors have, it's it's about half a trillion dollars. So these are very large you know, state pension plans and they'll commit that capital to us for a period of time. And these partnerships tend to have a 10 year life. So our capital is very predictable um, and we have it for a very long time. Typically we'll have about five years to make new investments. And then you have another five years to sort of work with those companies and hopefully ultimately get them to exit. And then if we need more time beyond that, uh, we can get more time. So each fund is, an, you know, we call it a fund, but it's really an individual partnership. And that partnership has a duration of 10 years. And we have, again, about five years to invest. We can invest it faster than that if we find great opportunities. And that's essentially what we did in, in fund one. So we raised a pool of capital, we deployed it, uh, we're still working with all those companies, uh, but then we had to raise another fund uh, because we need more capital to invest in great franchise and multi-unit businesses. And I think maybe just to, I mean, just to, uh, to speak to you know why it happens. I mean, you're, that's the job of private equity is to find deals that are worthy of investment and then to create value for all the stakeholders in that process. The fact that Fund 2 was raised so quickly and closed so quickly is, is a sign, and many of those are follow-on investors. I, I, in fact, I'm one of the LPs in Fund 2. Uh, it's, I think it's, a, it's a, a validation that what Princeton Equity Group is doing is working. You don't go from you know, 250 to $575 million with if, you're not, if what you're doing isn't working. So that, that's great to hear that that's happening. Um, and, and to know that... Uh, Anyone who's looking at maybe taking an investment from private equity, knowing that if they're going to invest in your business, there's, you've got seven, eight years of time to grow that business. In some cases, deals go for five, four, six. It just depends, right? But there's, no, there's nothing written in stone there. But what is written in stone is that every fund that has ever started must close one day, right? <laughs> right? These aren't eternal um, things. And so that being the case, you know, if it goes to 10, 11, 12 years, you, you can be certain that whatever assets are inside that fund, they will trade to another fund or some other private group or, or go private or whatever that may happen. Um, when you guys look at making investments, uh, maybe just speak to what does Princeton Equity Group look for? What are the characteristics of the, maybe the founders or the industry or the, I, mean, I know where you're in franchising, but just kind of maybe just narrow that down for us a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So for us, we love the franchise or business model. Um, we love that multi-unit business model um, because they tend to be pretty predictable. When you've got you know hundreds of locations and you're adding you know twenty or forty or uh, we have some brands that are adding over a hundred locations a year. How you predict that business? Um, it's a lot easier to predict that kind of business than many other kinds of businesses that are out there. So we love multi-unit businesses. That's really our focus. That business model. But what do we look for? Well. We talk a lot about our four lenses. Um, for us, um, it always starts with people. Uh, that's the first lens. Um, so one of the things we're really proud of is the amount of high quality founders we've been able to, to back over the years. And um, I always think about it in terms of the, the babysitter test. Um, is this founder of a business someone I would let babysit my kids? And if you can't, okay. If you can't trust your children to the founder, then like, how, how could I trust my, my, my brand as, a, as an investor and as a, yeah. you know, an industry participant? Um, how can I trust franchisees to this founder? So that's really the first test. Um, the next thing um, is unit economics. So in franchising, for us, the four walls, whether it's a actual retail location, but obviously in home services, they're 
there often isn't a retail location, but that business that the franchisee operates, that has to be a really good business for the franchisee to own. And if that's a good business for the franchisee, it's going to be a good business for the franchisor as well. That franchisor will be a good yeah. business to invest in. So we spend so much time trying to find really the best unit economics in our industry to support. Um, the next thing we think about is um, fad risk. We really like businesses that have been around for a while. Um, um, we, we try to really think in terms of, hey, if I'm going to ask a franchisee to sign a 10-year franchise agreement uh, in, in a business where there's a location, maybe you're going to ask that franchisee to sign a 5 or 10 or 15-year lease. I need to know that there's going to be a business for that franchisee in 5 or 10 or 15 years. So we yeah. really think a lot about that. And if we, we really can't visualize how that concept lasts, we just move on to another one. There are thousands of concepts, right? We just find the ones that we think can stand the test of time. And then the last thing we think about is recession, uh, the recession question. We, we try to really invest in businesses that can do well in all economic environments. Again, you, our franchisees are going to have to pay their rent. Uh, again, if there's a physical location, whether or not you know unemployment is high or low, whether or not interest rates are high or low, um, whether the market's up or down. So um, we think a lot about trying to target those end markets that do well, really in all environments. Uh, that's awesome. And, and, and thank you, Red, for joining us. And yes, it is the best day. And Dan, thanks for joining us as well. Uh, just a reminder, Feel free in the chat to load in any questions you have for us. We'll get to you in about 20 minutes or so. I want to just come back to uh, something you mentioned, which is bad risk. And I think French, I've seen franchising take over, like, just increase the amount of interest in fads immensely. Uh, you know, whether it's frozen yogurt or cupcakes or, you know, or whatever, whatever the, whatever the newest fad is. And there's, there's a fad and then there's a trend. And sometimes fads become a trend. Uh, and fortunately, sometimes fads do not like perm for men hair, men's hair, right? Like, the, uh, how do you how do you know, Jim? Uh, how do how do you determine if something is a fad or it's a trend? Like, what are you looking for? What are the earmarks of those? Yeah. So, so one thing is is it a is a service that's been around for a while? So, if you think about going back to Massage Envy, um, when we invested in Massage Envy, um, the that's this idea that there was one place that you go to get a massage. Um, and that place was actually not in a major city. It was not at a five-star resort. It was actually where Americans live and work. That was really new, <laughs> believe it or not. When we did that deal, most Americans had never had a massage. The vast, 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 vast majority of Americans. So is that a fad? Um, we, th we thought about that a lot, right? Like, and then you think about it, well, look, everyone loves getting massage. People have been giving each other massages since the beginning of time. Um, what this company is doing is really more about access than the underlying service, right? They're, they're providing access to something people really want um, in a way that allows them to, to actually do it more than they could without the concept. So we tend to think in those terms, um, the way we deliver something might be new, but um, if that underlying service has been around for a while and it just has clear demand, then that may not be a fad, right? But yeah. there are a lot of other factors that go into it as well. I think um, said another way, you know, thinking about home services, right? Home services have been around forever, yeah. but the trend line is that fewer and fewer people want to do it themselves. Right. They're now outsourcing their home services to someone else. And therefore home services is a great investment because in general, and this trend isn't gonna stop, people will hire experts to do improvements around their home or, or maintaining or repairing things. And and another investment you guys have made is in LA Mental Health. I'm actually a franchisee of LA Mental Health. I have a, a couple locations here in Utah. And, and I looked at that and, and felt the same way. Yeah. Therapy and mental health has been something that's been around forever. But Ellie Mental Health is creating and improving access and removing some of the stigmas around it. 
and it's taking something that is needed, much needed in our, in, 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 and there is in general, a trend line. More and more people are very comfortable saying I have a therapist. Uh, yeah. I, I'm 49 growing up. If I said I had a therapist when I was in my twenties, that would have been looked down, looked down upon, frankly. Uh, today it's quite different. Oh, great. You're taking care of your mental health. Just like you would go to right. the gym. You see someone to help you on, on your, on your mental health. So I think that's important to note. Um, if you don't mind, let's just talk about people for a second. When you, I, I'm sure there's some founders in this call. They're probably wondering if they can be trusted with their own children. I've got five of my own. <laughs> I even wonder if uh, I would have passed that test. Just because I can make kids does not mean I can take care of them. <laughs> Scott, uh, you already passed the babysitter test. So yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. turn my kids uh, over to you for, uh, for Christmas. You can have yeah. them for you. <laughs> that would be, be great. Uh, maybe if you don't mind, just help us understand some of the things maybe you, you're looking for in founders. Like what are some of the skills? the skills i get like they're responsible and they can you know they they're a good human and all that stuff yes. but are you looking for certain skills do they have to be charismatic do they have to be uh, a visionary do they have to be an operate very operational or is it like it doesn't they can have different disciplines as long as they surround with the right people how do you think about that yeah look at, at at the end of the day they have to be committed to doing what's right for the business um you know there are a lot of folks out there that um just want to sell a lot of locations, right? Or they just want to, they've got a very short-term orientation. Um, one of the great things about franchising is you can build a business that can last for decades and decades and decades. Um, so we look for people that really think about the future in a way that's, look, in our modern world, you, you know, you, you read so much stuff about Entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs that are building these tech companies that in, in three years, they create a billion dollars of value and then they're gone, right? Like that's the exception. Um, great businesses take great commitment and great time um, to build. And if you do that, you can create a lot of value over a long period of time with a very different risk level than folks that are kind of trying to create these flashes in the pan. So we really think a lot about that. Is this person going to really do the right thing to build the business for the very long term? And that is somebody that um, is asking great questions. They are they have good command of the business, and ultimately they know they don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. but we are not looking for the person that, as one individual, can build a company to a billion dollars of system uh, revenue. Um, because I know if they think they can do it themselves, that, <laughs> that they're absolutely <laughs> going to implode at some point, right? Like it, yeah. you can't do it alone. So we need people who really realize that they've got to build an organization. They have to make decisions along the way that sometimes are selfless decisions to make. Um, and that's ultimately what we think a lot about when we underwrite the people. Yeah, I would, um, I have to agree with you, Jim. One of the things I, I, I interview with every person that five star hires every single hire the last interview is me and i always ask a question of people of you know for them to help me understand them what drives them crazy about other people it's like mm -hmm. if there's someone you know that drives you crazy what is it that drives you crazy about them the most commonly said answer is that someone that they work with is not teachable or open minded yes and and I think, and I think about that every time, like, yeah, that's, that drives me crazy. And it's a reminder to me as a leader and, and for all of you on this call, you know, we don't know it all and being open-minded and willing to take advice, I think it's critical, especially if you're considering bringing in partners. And with that, I want to segue to the next point around how Princeton Equity Group adds value. The moment a deal's done, a board is formed and is now being governed by people who have had lots of experience not they don't run the business you run the business right but they have an outside view that is highly valuable and if and i can speak for, my, for myself if i were to come to those meetings and there's you know there's usually four or five people from princeton equity group and my own management team and if i was not open-minded to receiving advice or thinking through things you know we just would not move as quickly or as well as an organization and or experience the growth that we've had and so if you don't mind, Jim, maybe speak to, you've done this enough times, I'm sure you know the levers that you generally will be pulling in an organization to, to create value for the franchisees, the people in the organization. What do you, when you think about buying a company, 
what are kind of the first two or three things you immediately go to as ways to add value in the organization? Yeah. So uh, it often starts with the people uh, around the organization. Um, you know, we always start with a, with a great founder uh, that we think can be in the business for the long run. Um, and, um, but often um, our businesses are growing very rapidly and the organization has to scale and evolve faster than the actual business scales and evolve. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the organization and how do we put a team around that founder that can really extend the runway of the founder in the business. Um, like so often we have founders that start, they get from zero to a hundred locations or 200 or 200, 300 locations, but we want to go to a thousand locations. And definitionally they've never run a business with a thousand locations. Um, so how do we put the team in place that can allow that person to thrive at a, at a thousand locations? Then it's a lot about how do we understand what's going on inside the unit? Look, when you have uh, 10 locations um, as a franchisor, as a founder of a franchisor, you can go visit every, every location once a week if you want, right? You could go, you can understand what's happening in the business. When you get to hundreds, if not thousands, you really need to do some real things to know what's actually going on in the business. So one, you have to have a team that's sophisticated enough to use data in the business effectively, but then you have to build um, an IT infrastructure that actually gets the information you need to understand what's happening and then ultimately make the right decisions. So, so often we're upgrading the IT systems at our companies, we're putting in business intelligence. And my goal is I would like to know more what's going on inside the unit, often minute by minute, uh, than the franchisee. And if I can yeah. do that as a franchisor, then I can actually help that franchisee improve performance. Uh, and until that happens, it's very hard to change the conversation with the franchisee. Um, so that's my goal. It, it, it takes time to get there. You can't do it in 12 months. You can't do it in six months. But certainly our goal is to do that over a two or three year period and then really use those insights to drive same store sales and, and unit level performance. Yeah. Uh, as you're saying that, Jim, I was just laughing to myself a little bit because, uh, you know, the as the CEO of Five Star Franchising, I'm no longer personally operating a brand. We've got seven different right. brands in our platform. I did do that at Five Star Painting. And, and had been doing it at Bass Solutions for a while as well. So I, I had some experience doing it. And I remember every year we would, you know, the, the, the obsession for data, in my view, has to be critical, especially as you're partnering with private equity. I can tell anyone here right now that if you uh, aren't data obsessed and don't have business intelligence, walk into a boardroom full of private equity people, <laughs> it's it's almost laughable. Like, they, I trust me, they've got questions and they're all data driven and it can't be anecdotal. It can't be just some feeling. There has to be something that's coming that's that's concrete, that's coming from the system. And, and I used to remember every year we'd have a convention and we would, I used to do report cards for the franchisees personally. I'd go in and I'd break, rate every franchisee on every one of the most important KPIs and I'd create benchmarks. And by the time that process was, was done, it took me about two weeks to create all the report cards. I'd hand the report cards to the franchisees and I graded them on everything from a closing rate, lead acquisition, cost per lead, you know, each salesperson themselves, sales levels, growth rates. And I found maybe 5% of the franchisees knew more than I did about their own business. And it, it, wouldn't, it wasn't that it was hard. Right. It's just that I took the time to go through the data and then help give them recommendations. And I think as a franchisor, that is so critical. So I'm glad you, you stressed that. And I can tell you from, even from ourselves, we've now bought a number of companies. Each time there's been a, a really big focus on how do we make sure we have information coming that's concrete at every level and reliable. So I, I wanna stress that for those of you listening, it is something that's needed, uh, whether you do a deal or not, uh, you, it's a right. best practice. <laughs> the other observation that, that uh, Jim brought up is people and, you know, you, thinking about how we find and attract the best people. And I can I can say from experience that having private equity and that extra set of eyes and connections and network has resulted in us 
being more careful about each hire. In some cases, using recruiters where necessary for the right people. In some cases, using our networks. But uh, thinking through, like, does this person help us get to the next stage in, in our business? And up leveling in each yeah. case. And it's uh, it's been refreshing. I'll say, you know, our organization today compared to three years ago is very different. And uh, much of that has come from Princeton helping us work through getting the right talent on the bus and uh, and making and helping us keep them there. So th that's a great uh, great point to make. Um, what do you think about marketing, Jim? H how much time is, does Princeton think about, like for example, get, generating more leads for franchise development or or getting more leads for franchisees? How do you add value there at Princeton? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so certainly on uh, franchise development, uh, for sure, we've got a whole playbook around that. Um, and um, you know, we've, we've got a lot of examples of us being able to go in and dramatically increase a franchisor's ability to award licenses. Um, and we really changed the mindset actually from selling licenses to awarding licenses. Um, so not only do our franchisors tend to award more licenses with us than they did before us, they tend to um, award licenses to better quality franchisees. Um, so um, it's absolutely a key aspect of what we do. Look, if you're in the licensing business as a franchisor, you have to be good at licensing. Um, so um, that's a big part of the playbook. Look, the, the, the work we do on um, at the unit level can be very important ultimately to being effective at marketing at the unit level. So we do spend a lot of time helping our uh, franchisors drive better marketing performance. But to do that effectively, you actually have to have the data and the information, yeah. which is why we, we, we always early on in investment spend so much time trying to get the right information and, and, and get it as close to real time as we can. So, yeah, I, I want to give a plug here for someone I have a lot of respect for at Princeton Equity Group just speaking on this point of, of uh, licensing and franchise development. So as a data point, five star franchising this year will award about 200 territories which uh, is more than most franchisors have uh, in their entire system right now in, in home service franchising. And so it, I'm very proud of that fact. And I'm not, I'm not saying that to brag or to say that we're that much, that, how amazing we are, although I'm very proud of our team and what they've accomplished. But one of the things that uh, Princeton Equity Group helped us with a lot is they have something called operating partners. And they tend to be uh, people who have done it. They've been in the ranks of a, another franchisor. They've lived the experience. They're at that point in their career now where they're now transitioning from being the operator to now being a coach to operators. And so Brandon Hare is uh, the operating partner at Prince Equity Group that assists us at Five Star Franchising. Uh, Brandon's background, he's been involved in thousands of, of territory awards that neighborly and uh, you know very connected in the industry, very knowledgeable, very involved. I mean, I talk to Brandon every couple of days um, and bounce things off of him. He's always trying to help in some way. Uh, he actually spends time with me and my uh, chief development officer who's in charge of our franchise development team, just going through best practices, you know. Uh, and, and what's nice is I, I sent a question out just a couple of days ago to, to Prince Equity Group. And my question was, hey, would you mind going through all your portfolio companies and tell me where they're finding success in franchise development? What is their cost of acquisition? What vendor partners are working? And I had a list of like seven or eight things. And four days later, Brandon's helping compile all this information that I'm using in my team to see where else, how can I do better around any element of, of license sales? Highly, highly valuable. Uh, and, I, and I think that's one of the reasons why you'd want to partner with a group like Princeton Equity Group. Um, I have a question here I want to get to right now. I've got some other questions I want to ask you as well, but uh, let me go ahead and go to our audience. Tony here asks a question. Appreciate the leverage buyout scenario and the models to arrive to the deal. How does Princeton Equity or private equity evaluate and or present the new investments into the franchise system post-transaction? How does the founder looking to sell ask for the, these types of commitments ahead of the transaction? Ideally, the deal includes the transaction price plus additional investments similar to venture capital you mentioned earlier. Often through consolidation, you lose the innovation, the entrepreneurship, the drive to create new value or decisions that may be longer than the five to seven fold period of the model. Thank you for hosting the call. Hey, great question, Tony, and lots of detail there. Um, I'll, I'll ask the expert, Jim, that's why you're here. Tell us, what do you, what, what can we uh, tell Tony here on this question? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so I, I think there are a few questions in there uh, for sure. Um, and I think one of them might be, how do we uh, present the investment to the franchise system? So how, how do franchisees feel about private equity ownership? Um, and look, that is absolutely part of, we have a whole, again, I keep using the word playbook, but a whole playbook around how um, a founder of a business communicates our involvement uh, to the network. And uh, the reality is, um, you know, with us, one of the nice things is that uh, we have a reputation in franchising. Uh, we have a history. I think across all of our brands, we've got uh, about 6,000 locations, um, two or 3,000 franchisees. Uh, we have a history of supporting franchisees really, really well. So typically franchisees um, are actually, uh, they're always intrigued in the beginning. Um, they generally view it as a good thing. Our founders aren't going anywhere. So that's also good. And then honestly, what tends to happen is after the announcement's made, a few weeks later, franchisees go about their business. We're not terribly visible to them. So uh, it's almost like business as usual after the announcement's made. But but how you announce it, the timing, the approach, the words you use, all that is something we've done over and over again and uh, we can do pretty effectively. So, yeah, and, I'll, and I'll speak from experience on this, having done it a few times, having been purchased and having bought a number of companies, uh, franchisees are always resistant to change, no matter what it is. In fact, human beings are, like everyone is, every, you are, I am, we all are. And whenever change occurs, the first thing people ask is, what does this mean to me? How does, it, how does this impact me? If you understand that is the concern at the heart of, and soul of any of these changes, then hitting that head on is very important. And I have always just stressed, when we buy a company, we don't buy a company for it to re remain stagnant. And in franchising, the only way that we grow is through adding more franchisees, which happens because a model works, right. or by expanding franchisees, unit economics, and improving their, their own business. So there's an, a natural alignment of private equity who wants growth, a franchise model that wants growth within the franchisees and the franchisee. So adding that third layer, I guess the fourth layer, because there's a customer, the franchisee, the franchisor, and then, the, and then private equity. Adding that fourth layer, I actually just would say would bring more scrutiny to any decisions around how do we increase or grow the business. So it means good things. In my experience, I've always been asked the questions at every single town hall I've held with new franchise brands and their franchisees. At every annual convention, I'm pulled aside and asked these questions, and they all understand that when it's explained correctly. Mm -hmm. I think, Tony, the other question you were trying to get to, though, is that, you know, what happens post-transaction around investments into maybe yeah. new programs or new ideas or new, you know, new products or new services or, or, or something like that? And how do you do that? You know, the, there's the, the, the equity is put to work in buying the business. So you as the founder receive the capital, Right. And, or the shareholders, you and the shareholders all receive the capital for the transaction for what you've built. And now the business is now, the cap table changed, but the business still exists. It's the same business it was before, just has new owners and yeah. new cap table. That being the case, what, what happens next? So depending, Tony, on the size of business, some businesses are already cash flow positive. They don't need uh, you know, few more investment. Like for example, at Five Star Franchising, we've not asked for more capital from Princeton Equity Group to fund future growth. We haven't needed to, our business is cash flow positive. We just simply focus those resources more effectively on the right programs and are asking harder questions around what can or cannot work. But there are some instances where maybe a business is younger or, or require more capital, or it's a, maybe it's a capital intensive business where uh, capital is needed. And, and while I don't, I've not experienced this myself at Pfizer Franchising, I'm, I'm fairly certain that Princeton Equity is specializes in the capital business. Like that's actually, that's exactly right. what we actually <laughs> like putting capital to work. So <laughs> exactly. It's like, you know, if you told them, Hey, if you put money to work, we can make more money and faster than right. the money always shows up. I've, that's been my experience. So uh, I think it's a matter of those er, asking those questions early on. If you feel like you're going to do a deal, but you know, you need 5 million to buy a, make a plant or, or, or whatever, some new program, uh, it's just part of the conversation and maybe a, a part of the capital goes towards the cap table and part of the capital goes towards fu funding future operations. 
And I'm certain you've, de- you've dealt with that, Jim, in your history at Princeton. Yeah, so I, I do think it's actually a really good area of diligence for founders looking to bring on a partner. Um, you know, we always say that um, our founders should do just as much diligence on us as we're going to do on them. And trust me, we're going to do a lot on, on them and their business. So, you know, there are, we said, this range of firms that are more venture-like or more buyout-like. The buyout f- folks tend not to like to put follow-on capital to work, as we say in our in our world. So after the original investment, they tend not to make additional investments. Uh, they've kind of locked in the return. They're going to do the LBO, and that's kind of it. The venture folks tend to do a lot of follow-ons. They're backing earlier stage businesses. Again, we're in the middle. Um, we actually love the idea if we get to know a founder and we ha- we own a great business together and there are ways to deploy additional capital, we're actually a fan of that. And in franchising, there can be some great ways to do that. Uh, one, we can add other often complementary brands. Um, so what often will happen is we'll start with a great concept that has a certain amount of runway. We build out this development organization that can award a hundred or in Scott's case, 200 licenses a year. At some point, there is a runway and you know, there's a market opportunity for that core brand. Can we deploy those development resources effectively on other brands? So one use of capital for us would be to buy other complementary concepts. And we've done that multiple times, kind of created various platforms. Another area that could be a use of capital is to do corporate locations over time. Uh, those can be super tricky. Uh, there's a lot of um, franchise relations to navigate in doing those, but we've done that very effectively in a lot of brands. And that can be a use of capital, you know, international expansion. So there are good uses of capital. And what it comes down to is, are you picking a partner that is actually entrepreneurial enough to do those things? Believe it or not, a lot of guys in our industry look more like bankers than investors, and they just Mm -hmm. want to make a low risk return. We really like building great businesses of great value here and are willing to be more entrepreneurial as a result. And and I can just speak to that myself. We did our deal in September, 2021. Uh, We put a lot of additional capital to work in acquisitions. We bought five companies over uh, the next 18 months. Uh, And so, you know, when there's opportunity, capital tends to show up, especially where you can see an opportunity for growth for the, the organization. So hopefully that answered your question, Tony, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I want to come back to a question I've got, I'm sure that a lot of people have, and that is creating value for the business and, and the drivers of value. You mentioned, you know, it's people, unit economics, fad risk, and having buying businesses that are not recession resistant. On the flip side, as a founder, if you were to you know, speaking to a founder here and, and talking about ways in which they can increase the value or the multiple of your business. There's lots of things that go into that. Unit economics you mentioned, growth rate, industry they're in, it, meaning whether they're exposed to recessions or not, the management team they have, how good franchise development's going. Wh- where would you say, like, where should a founder, if a founder was looking at preparing their business to be sold today? You know, they've got a company doing a million and a half, two million, three million, four million dollars, but the where should they be focused on their organization today before they had a conversation with Princeton? Yeah. Well, again, it goes back to being long-term oriented. So we we tend not to do a lot around um, packaging or dialing up or down investment before we would go to exit a business. Um, we just do what's right for the business. And what's right for the business tends to be investing in the team ahead of the growth. Um, um, which is a really big one, um, awarding f- locations to great franchisees, right? Like w- w- what, when you go and sell your business, particularly one, um, you know, that's valuable. <laughs> you know, I like to say that, um, it's very hard to find dumb money when you need a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like maybe if you need, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, right. That, that's one thing, but if you need a hundred million dollars to, you know, your business is worth 50 or a hundred or $150 million, the people that ultimately invest in that business are going to see through a lot of the tricks you might think, oh, well, I need a CFO, but I'm not going to hire one because I, I want to boost EBITDA, right? Like 
we're going to say, no, you need a CFO. And even if you tell me EBITDA is 5 million, I'm going to reduce that by the amount of a high quality CFO. Like we're going to, we're going to, we're going to see through a lot of the tricks. Yeah. So the advice I always give is grow the business, operate the business as though you're going to own it forever. That is, um, I, I've said this over and over again, any business I've ever been involved in is a business that I'm going to build that I would want to keep forever. Yep. Because if I don't sell, I don't want to be in a position where I had trimmed and window dressed something to look good, but now I'm missing the important elements of the business. Yes. And, and a big part of that for me has always been um, bench strength and the or people in the organization. I, I'm, I always look at building a company that doesn't need me. It may, it may operate better with me, and ultimately, I, can, I hope I can add enough value in the organization that everyone benefits from my presence, right? But I always think about how do I build an organization that can operate without me? And that means I need to have people that are better in their responsibilities than I could ever be. And so I think that for me, the biggest focus has always been attracting the top talent you can get in the organization. And that, and that unlocks, frankly, every other piece of value that's, that comes around growth rate, attracting better franchisees. It's just this really positive snowball yeah. effect. Um, I'll end with this last question uh, for you, for Jim, and then I want to thank everyone for, for joining us. If any other questions come in, feel free to, you've got four minutes left before we, we, uh, we tie things up. But it, what advice would you give an aspiring CEO or founder uh, that may one day want to partner with Prince Equity Group? What, what would be like, you know, this is the thing you need to be thinking about more than anything else. Um, so, uh, I think we've talked a lot about just building a business for the long term. Um, but I think it's a lot about as well, um, you getting yourself into that place where you are very coachable. Um, you mentioned this before. Um, no one wants uh, to back a know it all because um, there's no such thing as a know it all. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's being um, uh, humble and um, trying to actually be the best you can be. Look, running a very large company is hard. Um, and no one is really born with the ability to show up one day and run a, a, a business with a billion dollars of system revenue, right? That, that is a big, big business. And the only way to get there is to surround yourself with the very best resources you can get and the very best education you can get. Um, so that that's the advice. I mean, I, I think be, be willing to work very hard and to grow every year. And one of the things we, we talk about here just at Princeton Equity Group, it's uh, it's the end of the year. It's review review time for for all the, uh, the, the, the professionals here. And one thing I always think a lot about is have they actually grown year over year? Like, can they do more this year than they could do last year? Well, what, do they have better judgment this year? than they had a year okay. ago. The same is true for any founder. Um, have they grown year over year? And that should be the goal. That's, that's a great reminder. Um, and, I, and I just wanna touch on this for just one second. The, uh, having owned a lifestyle business where uh, you have lots of flexibility, I find that uh, I am a better individual when I'm reaching for something that is well beyond my reach. And I have loftier goals, and this is this in partnership with Princeton has helped me ultimately lift my gaze up to something that was much bigger, much more exciting. Uh, the The organization is growing so fast; we're we're sixteen times larger today than we were three years ago, roughly. And so, what that means is all kinds of new challenges, which are very very exciting and demanding. And and uh, if you're thinking about one day partnering with a, a private equity firm, I would encourage you uh, that to say that lifestyle is great. You know, it's, it's nice to have a good balance sheet, but uh, life is f very fulfilling when it's very challenging. So thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this call. Thank you, Jim, for being available to us all and sharing us some insights into private equity. And uh, we'll see you all next month. Hey everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this video and more importantly, that it brings some value in your building your home services business. If you'd like to access more of this amazing content, like and subscribe below. If you'd like to be part of our live recordings and get involved with the speakers and myself, click the subscribe to counter button or the link in the description to get updates to future events.